Awesome. How did how did you guys hear about one million cups? You're told about it. Word of mouth. Get a friend who comes. Well, that's great. It's uh, it's every Wednesday right here at nine a.m. and it's sponsored by the Kauffman Foundation out of Kansas City. So there's meetings like this going on across the country um, in over eighty locations, and um, so it's fun to be a part of that bigger community. And um, one thing for all the presenters um, that are going to present, or presenting today, or have presented, if you're interested in checking out the website and seeing other cities that you can go present at, and uh, kind of learn more about their communities and get networked there, let me know, and we can we can send your application over to them as well. So it's a fun way to to travel around and get to know more people. Um, okay, well we've got a great panel this morning, and uh, we've got Sam and Dave. Sam is from Peak Ventures, and Dave is from Reese Capital. And so, oh, the singing group. You're too young to know that. Oh, the singing group called Sam and Dave. Okay, so you know, maybe at the end of your comments, you could do a little number for us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Well, um, let's go ahead. Uh, and the format is we're going to have the presentation, we're going to turn it over to the panel, uh, and then we'll open it up to the audience for um, QA. So um, we'll go ahead and turn it over to Trash Talk. And uh, and get going. There you go. Thank you. All right. So I'm Matt Little. This is Alex Andrews, and we're Trash Talk. And we are all about helping recycling programs become more efficient and profitable. Thank you. Uh, so we'd like to introduce our team first. Um, as you can see, we're a product of the Crocker Innovation Fellowship at BYU. It's a program that focuses on innovation and entrepreneurship. Um, so because of that, there's actually six, we have six co-founders, you know, it's a little unorthodox, uh, but it's actually been awesome. We have some great team members from all different backgrounds, and it's really been helpful in uh, learning and finding different problems. As part of the Crocker program, we study pretty heavy the nail it and scale it methodology, and so following right along that, we're going to tell you today about uh, the pain that we found and how we validated it, the solution we found and how we validated it, validated it and our go-to-market strategies. So first to explain the pain a little bit, uh, recycling managers, they waste a lot of time or money due to inefficient collection. And to help us understand what that looks like, let me just show you two pictures. So they don't like seeing this, where it's overflowing, or, and they also don't like seeing this, empty bins. So both require extra time, uh, there's wasted fuel and truck time with empty bins. And so uh, we, we think that, you know, uh, or we thought that, okay, this is a problem for them. They want to be more efficient. So to validate that, we went out and we talked with 60 university recycling managers and 10 commercial recycling managers, and we started asking questions about this. And what we discovered was that it was, for some people, a very strong pain. So Ryan Smith of Recyclops said, I think about this every time I do pickups. So 44% of those people we talked with felt this pain strongly, like Ryan Smith. 28% um, they weren't aware of this pain, they didn't feel it. And then another 28% they felt it, and they, uh, but they felt that it was kind of solved or taken care of for them. Um, awesome. So I want to tell you a little bit about the solution we work on. Um, we believe that university recycling managers save up to 80% in collection costs by using our trash talk routing system. Uh, so what that means is we developed a software platform um, that kind of connects custodians on campuses, um, the recycling managers, as well as the drivers. And so what that would look like is the custodian is going to report when a site or a building, uh, when their recycling bins are ready for pickup. Um, and the recycling manager is then notified. He can see a, a list of anything and everything that's full that day and what he needs to care about, what he needs to pick up. And the driver is given an optimized list, one that is, uh, makes most efficiency and, and fuel economy, economy in mind and everything like that in order for him to pick up. Um, and so how we validated this is we've been working with, uh, doing a beta test at BYU right now, just up on campus. Um, and we found over a three-week span 80% uh, efficiency improvement. 
Um, and a very, very conservative estimate from that is a potential $40,000 savings um, annually for BYU. Um, additionally, we've been doing a large-scale survey across the U.S. with a number of different universities um, and found it's kind of ongoing. We're getting more and more responses every day. Um, we've got 84 responses, and about 60 of them are very interested in being more involved, um, learning more about it, and even being uh, beta testers and things like that for us. Um, we want to give you an idea of the competitive landscape uh, that we're in. As you can see here, there's a few, Big Belly, Compology, and Evo, um, a few companies doing similar things, but um, with different approaches. So they're focusing more on the commercial side of things, um, which means that they're very technology heavy. A lot of these rely on, on sensors, um, even unique dumpsters that uh, are pretty expensive and pretty technology heavy, like I said. We have found that there's a pretty big niche with universities where they already have an infrastructure set up to rely on the custodians um, to kind of act as the sensors. And so we found that um, by focusing there on more low, low cost, purely software based uh, solution, we can have our cost be so much lower and then be able to kind of take over that niche right there. Yeah, so like Alex was saying, um, we want to focus and get the quickest way to revenue. So we want to focus on getting the riches in the niches, and that is true because it rhymes. <laughs> um, and and our, our solution is really tailor-made for universities because universities have custodians, as Alex mentioned. So we want to focus and really dominate and, and uh, win that market completely. And our channels to reach university recycling programs is direct sales, also trade shows or university recycling competitions, because that's actually a thing, and uh, also referrals. Bill Rudy at BYU, he is very connected in the recycling industry, so we've been making sure to take extra good care of him so he can help us out down the road. Um, and the thing that really gives us an advantage over our competitors that we want to bank on is keeping this low cost structure and then also just attacking market share and getting so many customers that we have existing relationships and, and have switching costs that prevent people from, from using a different solution. Um, and just to give you an idea of our market potential, we have about 2,400 universities in the U.S. and about we estimate about 600 targeted university customers, there could be more. Um, and then with that, uh, we estimate that our annual potential for revenue would be 4.4 million down the road. Um, but, and that's great, but we also, we also want to grow and make sure we're focused on that. Awesome, so some short-term goals that we're looking to, to accomplish that um, is starting to make some sales pretty soon. Um, after collecting a lot of data at BYU and, and really having an awesome time with that, we're excited to sell to them pretty soon. Um, more reasonable would be July 5th, I think, to sell at BYU. But then also through some other beta testers um, and some of these trade shows that I was talking about, we're excited to start uh, getting a lot of customers and, and being able to earn some revenue. Uh, a little bit more long term, um, we are interested in creating an Internet of Things sensor um, to expand into more of the commercial market. We believe that we can uh, deliver an effective solution to that and be able to take, especially in cities, um, is a, a space that not a lot of these other companies have focused or, or had a lot of success with. So we're really interested in, in diving more, doing some more research, and finding out more about that. Additionally, we're really interested in, as we've kind of gotten more into the university ecosystem and found some things, some things that go well and some things that go not so well for them, um, we're interested in finding other inefficiencies that they have and, and providing other software solutions. We think there's a lot of room to grow there, actually. So we are trash talk. Thank you guys. First. Yeah. All right, guys. Uh, thanks for the presentation. I'm going to hammer you on your team. And this is in no particular order, so I'm just going to go through the thoughts um, as you guys are presenting. If that's okay. Okay. On the team. You actually put a bullet into the gun instead of taking bullets out of the gun. Every investor is looking for reasons to say no. And you actually gave us one when you said, you know, it's a little unconventional for us to have so many co-founders. Never do that. Anything that could possibly be negative in your presentation, you, you only want to introduce it if you know that it's actually an approach to take a bullet out of the gun. And so one of the things that you could have said is, you may have a concern that 
a lot of co-founders is unwieldy, overbearing, too many you know, chefs in the kitchen, whatever. Actually, this works really well for our team, and here's why. And then go on to actually say why it's a benefit to you instead of just leaving it as a, you know, it's a little unconventional, and then moving on and leaving some lingering doubts. Next, next thing, on your team slide, it looked like you had your majors on that, which is a very academic approach to your team. It doesn't really give an investor the understanding of why this team is actually good. Anybody can have a particular major, but you selected those team members for a particular purpose, right? So what are they doing? How are they helping you get there? And put their specialty, their function, their passion, whatever it is that actually lends some credibility that they are the right people for trash talk on that slide. And then talk to it. When you are in the current stage that you are in, the team is like 80% of the decision, right, from an investor's perspective. And we have to know that we have all of, you know, there's two things. One, all of the roles necessary to scale your company are filled. And two, the people that you've chosen to fill those roles are A-level people. And there wasn't a sense of that yet. I think you could get there with some slight modifications. Yeah. Um, on the pain, it, it, there was a big question in my mind as to whether or not the pain that you're solving is a legitimate pain that could yield a scalable business that would just dominate a market and really give you um, tremendous revenue. And so as you were justifying it, there were a couple of things that were good and a couple of things that were bad. One of the things that was bad, and this is no disrespect to Ryan Smith, but having him as your as your like banner customer quote actually made it made your business provincial and small and relevant to BYU only and having a startup, a fellow startup kind of validate your overall pain. Now if you are going to scale your business through customers like Ryan, Recyclops programs, awesome. You know, he's a great quote. And again, this is no disrespect to him. What you might want to consider doing is actually going to the opposite end of the spectrum. Who is the biggest, baddest customer in the entire nation? Can you get on their radar and get a salient quote from them? Yeah. Yeah. That would give you credibility. Next one, the, your competitive landscape. Um, this one may sound nitty gritty, but if you can land this concept, I think it could be very powerful for your presentation, which is right now, in fact, can you go to that slide? Your verticals are different uh, customer targets. It looks like, yeah, universities, commercial, residential. Um, this is good, but it's not great. What would be great is if you could ascertain within the competitive landscape what the two fundamental dimensions of competition are. You ask any one of your target customers, why would you buy from us or why did you buy from them? And you start collating those answers and you're gonna find that there's gonna be patterns, right? And you're gonna find that there's two reasons to believe, two reasons to buy that are more dominant than all the rest. Those should be your two angles, your two dimensions on this chart. And then you map where trash talk is versus everybody else. And hopefully what you want to show is nobody competes. Right now, this is a niche-oriented slide, which I think is what the logic was, um, which again is good, but it's not great. It doesn't really give any indication of why you would actually win in the marketplace, which is what your competitive landscape sh slide should show, is why you're going to win. The next one is uh, universities. In my, in my mind, so, so we do a lot of ed tech deals. We, um, we have seen hundreds of ed tech companies in the past year. All of them that anchor on universities actually have a fundamental problem. And that problem is combined with two different buckets. Number one, the total number of universities is small. And number two, the way to break into university budget systems is difficult. They're bureaucratic, long sales cycles, et cetera. So if you're going to start at universities, um, this will actually send a signal that it's convenient for you, maybe because you're students, and really inconvenient for your business. So what you want to do is, I think, broaden your horizons. You know, if you've got something that really does save 80% of efficiency, and then I'm going to get to that 
line item in just a second. Like that's cool, right? That's a significant savings, hopefully, to somebody. So if you ask yourself the question, who wins if we win? I think the answer is other companies outside of universities actually win bigger than universities win by implementing trash talk. That's my guess. And so who would those be? That's who you target. Go to the biggest mass of customers that win the most with your service and start there. If it makes sense strategically. Um, next one, your timeline. Can you flip to that slide really fast? Thank you, right here, yeah. Um, your timeline seemed good, but once again, not great. And what the reason why I say this, and this is much more subjective, and this is just having, so we've seen like 5,070 deals now, big ventures in the last two years. So we have this really interesting bird's eye purge over, over the overall flow of early stage ventures. And just from that perspective, what I'm seeing here compared to the aggressive, um, highly entrepreneurial, full of hustle teams that are just killing their numbers and then they come for investment. What that means to me is that this timeline is simply not aggressive. It seems to be a very passive um, timeline. And what you want to do is you want to say, what's the fastest way to the biggest amount of customers that will prove our hypothesis? Hypothesis, we are not going to be satisfied with the n equals one sample size, right? We're, we need like 30 plus, and the more that we have on the plus side, the better. That proves our hypothesis. So those 50 customers at the end of the year, like pull it back and say to your team, team, how could we, through creativity, determination, and sure hustle, get those 50 customers tomorrow? Or at maximum within the next 30 days. And let's use this time because time is our greatest um, ally or our biggest you know, detriment. How do we use this time to prove the fundamental hypotheses with a mass load of customers? And that's, that's all my thoughts. Other, other than that, great job, guys. Thank you. Boy, Sam, that was really thorough. I think you said you've done this before. I'm not sure a lot to add. Um, the thoughts that came to my mind, um, number one, I see this as a big market, recycling, garbage, you know, especially recycling, it's a, and it's a thing people are talking about, right? But um, it seemed like the target that you're targeting is the smallest part of the market. And the most challenging, like Sam said, because when I think university, I think government, I think budgets, I think you gotta get into the budget cycles, I think slow moving. And, and it's just it's a tough if you're jumping in, that that just is a tough industry to start with because it seems like the decision making process, I don't know, your experience is not fast for universities. There's a lot of people involved. Um, the other thing that was interesting to me. It sounded like you were creating a technology to help, but you actually, your competitors actually have technology and you're gonna take a step back and use less technology for your solution. And that's, that's a, that's a, I wasn't clear why that was better than what the competition was doing. And, and uh, when you got the, it seemed like cost was a big piece of that. It wasn't clear in your slides what are you saving and how much, I think there was a number like 80%, but why you know, you know, why would you convince someone who's using a different service to use yours, you know, demonstrate how that cost difference would make someone want to switch to what you're, you know, what you're doing? That's a great question. So um, recycling programs, like with the fall of commodity prices have become not so profitable. And so it's a really price sensitive customer and with just a software solution, we have a lot, like our margin is a lot higher. Um, and so we can charge a lower price and it's already cost sensitive customers. And so that, does that make sense why yeah. that would? Yeah, go back to the very, very first slide. <clears throat> so 
Sorry, not the very, very, sorry. Keep going. <laughs> uh, keep going, sorry. Next one, next one, next one. Okay, so go back to that pain slide. So I'm gonna get back to the point I was just making, but, but um, you know, I think from an investor perspective, we love businesses where 100% feel the pain strongly, 44% feel the pain strongly. That's that's a tough number too. Um, and my guess is it's more than that. It's probably based on just your sample size. But I wouldn't focus on that that chart, I would not put on your slides because that doesn't make me feel like, wow, this is a business I really want to invest in because more than half the people are actually just fine with how things are. So half the time when I talk to people, they're not going to have any idea that what I'm talking about, that there is any pain. So you may want to approach that that a little bit differently. Um, anyway, get, move to the forward. Sorry, I'll, I'll tell you when we get there. Next one. Yeah, right, right here. So go back. So, um, so what I see here is is a custodian reports. And when it says reports, is that in your system? Is that what they're doing in your software? Yeah, they go they go on the website, and press a button, and that's all they do. Okay, so they press a button for whatever location or whatever. Okay, and then it helps. Okay, and but again, that that manual intervention, even though you're doing that now, I think the ultimate goal is is, is to take out as many manual processes as possible in this. Anytime you're relying on a person to do something and your your competition is using sensors in their recycling bins that don't doesn't require any person touch, that to me I you know, that, that's a disconnect. I would rather have something that doesn't require human intervention. Because again, the scaling question becomes it's harder and harder to scale the more people are involved in the process. So anyway, that's just something to think about. I would spend more time trying to talk about your solution, your software versus the competition's technology and what, you know, what are the differences and why are what you're doing better because, again, the world is moving to more technology, not less. And when I come in and say my solution is less, has less technology, and I don't understand what, you know, what's wrong with their technology and why it doesn't work versus what you have. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, so that's the other point I have. Um, yeah, those are my comments. Okay, thank you. All right, we're going to go ahead and open it up to the crowd here. So just uh, if you've got a comment, just raise your hand. I'll bring the microphone over. Yeah, so I just had a question about the 20% who said they felt the pain but had solved it in some way. What ways were they solving their pain? Uh, so some people have used some of the systems that we're talking about. Uh, a few of those other companies like Inovo, Big Belly, um, and then some of them, uh, I think, kind of what, like what was mentioned, whether the sample size or what, um, a lot of times it's hard to, people feel the pain, they maybe don't feel the pain, the numbers reflect that the pain is there, but as some of the recycling managers don't realize, you're wasting this much time and this much money doing this, is that not a problem to you? And they're like, we like our system the way it is. Recycling managers we found are, they tend to be this whole environment, the whole space is pretty, it's not resistant to technology, but they're not all about like the newest, greatest thing. Like they want it pretty simple, pretty straightforward, and so they think all the times that they have it solved. Hi, um, I, I really appreciate what you're doing. I love the idea of people being interested in making the world cleaner and greener and, and recycling. I would have really been interested, you know, from my standpoint, I'm interested in finding out how much that we recycle really goes forward. And to me, this is a better not-for-profit program, frankly, uh, versus adding more expense into a system in any way that's already encumbered um, is it, difficult. But um, I really love what you're doing and, and your interests here. Um, I, I'm kind of curious, when you go back east, uh, at least the old story is, and I think it's still true, the mafia runs this business back there, and uh, so you know, I'm wondering. They're great businessmen, by the way, and so <laughs> you, you will, uh, you you may be able to make a deal. I don't know, <laughs> but good luck to you on this on this project. 
as far as the critique is concerned, some of this minutia on, on presenting would be great if you could get, present that to a, critic, a critical committee or a group prior to coming to the thing, and then they, they can spend an hour telling you where to improve it. But thanks, great job. Let us know if you have any ends with the mock <laughs> Hi, my name is Rod Blanchard. Um, in your presentation, I never saw what exactly it is that your software does. Um, I mean, what's the wow factor? I mean, what you know? I mean, it seems to me like a custodian pushes a button. I mean, he can text and say, "Pick up my garbage," and that's basically what. I mean, is that it? Um, more or less, the answer is yes. But okay. I'll tell you why it's a wow. Okay. Um, the way that recycling and trash collection has been set up in our country, uh, we I think it is inherently not efficient. We pay this, I, my family of seven pays the same amount as my grandma who produces way different levels of trash and they pick up every Monday, Wednesday or Friday or something like that regardless of how full it is. If there was a slight shift of responsibility to where we say, hey, my trash is full, can you come pick up on this day? There's a huge increase automatically in efficiency um, but it doesn't make a lot of sense with residential. So if we take it to a, a university setting where it's all under the same umbrella um, budget, they want to be as efficient as possible. They have the infrastructure set up to where custodians are already the only ones emptying into certain recycling bins or dumpsters, and so they know exactly how full they are. Um, if they already know exactly how full they are, already doing their job like that, clicking a simple button and letting the, the managers know. We found at BYU was in three weeks they've gone from, like for example, picking up about 100 sites on campus to only having to pick up 20 a day. So 100 a day to 20 a day by that slight shift of responsibility, increasing communication just a little bit, has been, I think that's been a, a wow factor for us. Okay, and then the, the revenue model is never really explained. You said you, you know, you're projected $4 million, but I didn't hear you know, how to get to $4 million, what, what's, what am I paying for if I you know, purchase your software? Are you providing any, any routing solutions? To get, I mean, what, what exactly are you doing that would make me want to fork over some money? Uh, sure. Um, great question. So um, we're just keeping it very simple for now. Um, it's a, like an MVP for beta testing. So you know, our features on our website are very basic, but they're the essential ones that the managers need. And to basically price and um, so we have these four metrics that we get from the recycling manager, and then we multiply those metrics by a percentage of efficiency, like how many, how many, uh, a percentage of wasted uh, collection guys. And then we charge, um, we're planning on charging 40 to 60% um, of that. And so we save them, if we say we save them $40,000, then we, we charge like, Twenty thousand dollars or eighteen thousand dollars, and we, there's still twenty to twenty-two thousand dollars in cost savings. That's a lot of money. The technology already exists, and I can just push a button. Yeah, I mean, it is. It's very, very simple. Um, but I mean, we're, it's working so far with BYU, and they love it, and they don't want us to stop. So. <coughs> I, I think that you have a, a great opportunity with what you've got. I, I, I want to piggyback with what Sam said about universities are difficult to work with. Okay, and there's a lot of red tape. You have uh, an opportunity to get a lot of credibility from some major companies that would probably want to beta test this for you. Companies like Google or Apple um, or even uh, TV stations. Okay. So you, you, in that way, if they like what you're doing, then you can say, you know, we've tested this at Google, we've tested, you know, some, some major companies there, and you're going to be borrowing their names and their credibility. And if it's a TV station or something like that, then you've also got um, instant media coverage and things of that nature. You might consider trying those guys out as beta testers. Thank you. A couple of questions. You said you print out a route for them and it's the most efficient route. How do you calculate what the most efficient route is? Uh, 
We're just usually leveraging Google Maps API right now. So another thing on your slide is you said that the manager will print out the route and hand it to the driver. If you've already implemented the Google Maps API, wouldn't it make sense to just have the route on their phone so that the manager doesn't have to print out anything? Yeah, I think to us that makes sense. To the recycling managers, they their system already is that they have kind of an Excel spreadsheet of where they go. A lot of the drivers don't want to use their phones in a recycle, like in the truck that's kind of dirty and, and going to a place like that. They want paper. We we offered to do stuff like that, and they would prefer okay. it the other way. Interesting. Yeah, I think the missing step is what do you do with all the trash once you got it? You have Somebody that recycles it, do you recycle it? I mean, what's the cost in that? Um, so we're, we, we will participate in the pickups. They have, it will be implemented at uh, programs or functions that, that have a utility for that. So they take it back to the recycling dump um, and do. So, companies. Yes. Yeah, Anders. Last question. What can we as the One Million Cups community do for you? Great question. <laughs> um, so we're looking for, as you guys probably could hear, we need some mentoring. i uh, got a lot of work to do. So we're looking for specifically Internet of Things mentoring, um, as well as B2B, um, and some advice on pricing is kind of what we're looking for. And we love, I, I'm guessing we've taken up a good bit of time, so if uh, anybody is interested, We'd love to talk to you afterwards and and uh, see what we can do. Thank you, guys. We ran out of our one million cups cups, but next week come up and we'll have some more. Um, okay, you guys can go ahead and get set up. Um, I was just going to mention uh, John Richards from Startup Ignition has been really helpful and setting up the panel for us, and um, Startup Ignition has a free info session. It's going to be July 12th here uh, in this room here at 7 p.m., and they're talking about kind of the dangers of scaling your company too early. Um, so it's just a free info session. Come learn uh, from the presentation there, and then um, they'll also have some more information about um, start recognition and when the next cohort is going to start and everything like that. Um, all right. Well, we're going to go ahead and pass the microphone over to Shutterless. All right. Thanks. Good morning. Um, <clears throat> my name is Steve Barnes. This is RJ Rouse. We're with Shutterless. Uh, by way of introduction, uh, I am an attorney by trade. Been doing that for about five years, and uh, we just got started with Shutterless about uh, six months ago. <laughs> So I'm RJ. Uh, my background a little bit is I do public relations. I've done public relations for um, Robert Data Bry, and I do it for James the Mormon right now, if you know who that is. Um, but I wanted to start off with a story. So on one of my so shutter list is a place where you can go to find photographers, videographers, and photographers, videographers, and venues. Um, and my story starts off with, I was on a campaign with Robert J. DeBry and we needed to make a video for them. Um, so we had this great idea, but we didn't have a videographer and we had no idea where to look. So we asked our friends like who were some good videographers and they all had, you know, good, good ideas for it, but they were expensive or they didn't do what we needed. And so this is, you know, where this idea kind of came from is, uh, or was validated in that was we need a good place to find videographers, photographers, and venues for various things uh, for weddings. I'm sure all of you guys have uh, experienced that pain of just not knowing who to who to get or just asking on face on Facebook. So that's a little bit. Yeah. So so I think RJ just described, and I've had similar experience. That the, we, we've got this platform we're trying to develop. We've got two sides of the platform. We've got the photographers, the service providers. And then we've got consumers on the other end. And, and, and there's definitely a, a, a problem, we feel like, with the consumers being able to quickly find who they want. But uh, as we've kind of done our uh, nail it, scale it research and, and trying to um, validate the pain, we also found there's, there's quite a bit of pain on the photographer end. 
And uh, the, the biggest pain for, for most photographers is it's finding new clients. Even the big names, even the professional photographers struggle to find this you know, continuous pipeline of new customers. And then uh, kind of a secondary pain that we've discovered is, is that these photographers, the professional ones, feel like everyone these days with a digital camera, every mom is a photographer. And, and it's hard for them to get the message out to potential clients why they should spend the money to hire them as a professional. So going through this real quick, this is, you can kind of see our beta site. Um, this is the home page. We, like RJ mentioned, we're thinking about having uh, listings for photographers, videographers, and also locations and venues, which is um, some, something interesting that we've, we've discovered there, um, where there might be a need. Uh, so that you can see here, we, we want to make it easy for people to find a photographer. So we've got some listing filters. Um, we've got a summary of these different photographers. So you can quickly look through and compare. You know, uh, we wanted to have transparent pricing. Want to have reviews. Uh, essentially, our goal, our end goal, is to be the Priceline or Airbnb Expedia of the photography world, uh, and have a platform like that. Um, and and on mobile view, this is kind of what uh, some of the individual listing uh, pages would look like. Uh, we've got an easy way to click a button to contact the. Um, photographer and that will send them an email, a text message. We've, we've learned that photographers would like a, a direct notif instant notification, so we implemented the text messaging. Um, so we just want to go ahead and just show you the website. I think we're going to get this done a little bit shorter so we can start getting to our, our problem. Um, but yeah, if you click into here, um, you can see that we've integrated the Instagram on here. Oh, it's not even showing. Oh, it's nice to go back this Okay. Uh, it, it shows it. Yeah, we've, so we've integrated the Instagram. You can see it on the slide right there. Um, so they don't have to continually put up pictures on the site. Um, it just does that every time they put a post on Instagram. Um, they can actually book through the site. You can't see it on here. Um, but we have social sharing on there. But yeah, one of the things is you can book right through the site and you can pay right through the site as well. That was another pain point that we found um, because after you hire a photographer, you don't know where, like, how to pay him exactly. And so just do it through Shutterless and that'll be kind of the catchphrase. Um, so um, in our research, the photography market is about a, in the U.S. is about a $10 million uh, market. Um, if you take out the school photography portion, you're looking at $7.2 billion. Um, but we think our addressable market is about $5.7 billion with the portrait photography, the wedding photography, and um, commercial photography. Um, but, the, but the interesting thing is that this is a highly – fragmented marketplace, you know, each photographer is its own business and so it's not like you have big companies uh, where uh, people go to get their photography services, it's kind of a, a freelance type thing. Um, and then also in our research, and this, this is an example, uh, looking at Google Trends, the phrase photographer near me, you can see in 2013, way down there, and now here in 2016. Um, it's just exponential growth. Uh, so, so to us, this tells us that, you know, in the last couple of years, people primarily search for this type of thing on the web. Uh, as I mentioned, our goal is to be the Airbnb price line of the photography world. We think it's a good business. We think platform businesses are, are good businesses, very high returns on invested capital. And um, they do kind of have this modi uh, Characteristic about them because they uh, once once you're to scale and you have those network effects working um, and, and we think this thing called efficient scale that investors often uh, refer to would come into play where if you are a big the big dog in a, in let's say the Utah geographic market it's hard for other players to come in once you're established because it's not a big enough market to support two players potentially. And so there's high high returns on invested capital. 
Uh, but I just want to, I'm, I'm going to skip this uh, and, and go kind of straight to what we, we kind of wanted to get from this group. Challenges that we are facing. Uh, RJ, did you want to touch on that? So we don't want to go after every photographer. We just want the elite photographers, but we want every elite photographer. And so when they're on Shutterless, um, we're either going to do a transaction model where every time they pay, we get some of that as well. Every time the customer pays, we get that as well. Or we want to just make this an exclusive list where they pay um, a fee to be on the site. We don't think that every photographer will pay that, but we think a lot of them will. But we also want to have every photographer on the site. So that's kind of our problem is how do we get every photographer, every elite photographer, videographer, venue on the site while still making money? Uh, that's our problem. And, and also I have up here, um, I think technology too, we, we could use a lot of help with that, advice you guys would have. And, and obviously funding is always an issue with, with startup. Um, but with that, we'll open it up for questions. All right, Stephen RJ, uh, great job. So I'm gonna, Put the hammer down, unfortunately, um, but it's in a spirit of, of helpfulness, right? The first thing when you guys started out, um, you said, "I'm a lawyer, and I'm in public relations," and that kind of derailed me at least from the beginning because what I didn't hear is why are you guys even doing this? And you you started out with a, a story, you know, after you introduced yourself at PR. Uh, that kind of wove into this. But right now at your stage, the whole decision is really, the bet is on you, the investment is on you, you personally. It's not on the business, it's not on the problem. You know, technically an investor would invest in your business, but fundamentally it's an investment in you guys, right? So you may want to consider a different approach to the way that you introduce yourselves. And what you want to essentially convey is we are the best team in the world at building a network of photographers, videographers, and then the consumers that go to our central hub to find these folks. And oh, by the way, I happen to be proficient at law. And oh, by the way, I'm the best PR dude ever. You know, it's kind of the, the approach, if that makes sense. The second thing is at the beginning when I when you first introduced the topic i thought oh boy are they in a declining industry with the proliferation of phones that have better and better cameras you even said it yourself everybody is a photographer now you know is there an overall sense of regression away from the expensive perhaps uh, professionals and more towards the amateur your google chart i think was an interesting data point but it came late in the game this is a bullet that I think you need to take out of the gun of the investors right at the beginning. And you say, some may think that the rise of the amateur uh, photographer means that the overall photographer um, profession is declining. Well, get this, and then you put in your data points. What this means is that people are actually more appreciative of higher quality photographs or whatever the, the logic point is. And you, you show how you're actually in a big market that's increasing and not declining, as would be kind of a logical assumption. Then when you went to like what you were doing, mm -hmm. the strategy of building a moat around yourself, I think is legitimate. However, it's, it's also one of the biggest. And any time that your business model depends fundamentally on building two networks, a dual network problem, that is like hard with a capital H and an exclamation point at the end of it. And so a clear path to hacking these networks, not hacking in a bad way, but hacking in a more modern way, which is simply the fastest, easiest route to your end goal, right? Things that's missing, like fundamentally missing from the verbal uh, dialogue as well as the presentation is how you're gonna hack your network, how are you gonna do this? And so you kind of mentioned at the end that this is one of the biggest problems that you're facing. Yeah, like that's a fundamental problem. 
and the winner of your space is going to be to whoever figures out how to hack the network. And so what you don't want to do is you want to, you don't want to say, we're still facing the problem. It's an unknown. It's in front of us. Rather, everybody else faces this problem. We cracked it. And here's how we do it. And then you actually show a chart showing the number of photographers on your site over time. And then the number of users. And I know that the technology isn't quite there yet. But I think that there's some interesting things that you can do to test your hypothesis. There was a company um, called Ask You that presented to us. They wanted to get um, a dual network within the university setting. They had tried really simple experiments about how to hack their network, and they showed that within a three-month period of time, they could actually get 80% of students within any target campus. That was the hypothesis. That was the basis of how they could create a network, and that was perfect uh, fodder for discussion. And so I would challenge you guys, go test your hypothesis about that you actually can hack your networks and come to the next you know, investor discussion with evidence that you have cracked it, not that the problem is still in front of you. Um, can you go to your, mobile, your market opportunity slide? This is my last comment, then I'll shut up. Yeah, right here. There's a fundamental trap that unfortunately a lot of us entrepreneurs fall into when we try to describe the market opportunity or the TAM, the SAM, whatever the acronym is that we choose to put up in front of people. And the trap is that we go top down. The, the reason why it's a trap is because you can't execute against a top down evaluation of your market your approach to the market will never hit $7.2 billion in the current form because there's no clear path to get there. So what you want to do instead is say, we have figured out um, on a small scale about how to crack, you know, how to hack our network. Our approach yields this sort of town. You know, there are X number of customers. We think we can get Y dollars of revenue for each per year. X times Y equals M. And if you build it from the bottom up, then it's ever so much more meaningful because it's actually operational. You can go get that that money. Whereas right here it's just theoretical. Thank you. Right, so <clears throat> just to add to what Sam's just saying, um, when you start, you know, my my only thought when you when I got to this was exactly what Sam just ended with was Oh boy, here they go. They've got to build a network, meaning you've got to build a marketplace. You've got to build because you've got to find the supply and the demand, right? And like you said, that is really hard to do. When he talked about doing some testing, it ties into this slide, I think, because every photographer doesn't do every single thing up here, right? And as you start testing and start trying to hack and figure out where the real pain point is and who the real adopters are of this platform, then you can address, you know, it's weddings. It turns out that weddings are the target right now. You know, instead of trying to tackle every photographer in the world, it's really the wedding photographers that have the biggest problem. So that's where we're going to focus. And then we think this platform is fit to serve this whole market. But that's, you know, we've got to... Right now, you see this really big problem of photographers and really big problem of people not being able to find them. But I can't, it's not clear to me where, where I would even start. And I think you going out and doing some of the, the testing will tell you where the place to start is. And you might need to narrow it. You know, photographers do, there, there probably are some that do multiple of these, but, but it feels like um, you've identified a big problem and, a, and you can identified that a platform would help it, but the real details haven't been unearthed yet, which is who are the real, who have the real problem, who are the real adopters here? And and then, like Sam said, how are you going to get consumers to find this and use it? And so um, the only way to know those things is to go start trying to figure them out. And it's going to take some time to figure out is my supply going to some? My supply is going to come up really fast, but my demand's not. Or my demand's going to come up really fast, but my supply's not. But if the demand shows up and there's not enough supply, they'll never come back. And so it's just, you know, that that is the whole issue here. Is I don't think anyone disagrees that 
when I think about where do I find a photographer, I don't know where to start, and having a platform to do it would be great. But um, you know, you've got to tackle. You've got to be able to show how you're going to be able to build that marketplace. That's that's this whole game. It's not even the technology. Everyone can build something that's cool and that has the features. It's really exactly what Sam said. So anyway, nice job. <laughs> Maybe really quick, um, the, the slide I, I skipped over was a lot of, uh, of what you were saying. Um, we don't have all the answers, but I, I think we could have at least given you a few. Um, so, so like I said, we want to focus on certain geographic areas because we can't spread ourselves too thin, and you need to build both sides of the market to scale um, within, like, let's say, Utah before people in Utah will start using it, right? And and so and then we also um, we, we we're we're looking at doing we're thinking about going a more exclusive route where photographers will feel privileged to be listed here and that it will be known that if you want a quality person if they're on Shutterlist they're kind of already pre vetted um, we, we found that to be receptive from from the photographer end um, and then also just having all these partnerships with uh, key you know influencers in the industry venues studios bloggers that that has shown some promise but i think we we still need to dig into details like you were saying one of the questions you asked was about the pricing model do you have any have you done any initial explorations to see what the, the membership fee model versus the per transaction fee model. I mean, having not spoken to one photographer, I don't think people, my guess is people do not like paying a fee, a membership fee, not knowing if they're going to get any revenue from it, and probably more interested in a rev share type model. But I was just curious if you have, take, have figured that out yet or talked to many people about that. Yeah, that's that's been one of our biggest questions, and when we talk to photographers, we we always ask that. Um, and uh, I mean, surprisingly, a lot of the photographers will say, "I don't mind a monthly fee if you can show me the value that I'm getting for it." But we do find it difficult to show value when you're you're just starting up and you don't have, you know, a huge demand side. <laughs> and um, so so we found that we can get people to sign up if we tell them, you know. To sign up it's it's free and you know I think for now they like the transaction model but if we were established they wouldn't mind the monthly fee model so I think right now we're kind of going towards a transaction model at least until we get to scale right. okay so you talked about using the Airbnb model and being an avid user of Airbnb I love Airbnb um, but I always rely upon the the reviews, and but you also talked about being having the exclusive uh, photographers. I think those are two very separate things. You can't have follow the Airbnb model, but yet have exclusive uh, members. Uh, so I think you need to really analyze that as to whether the Airbnb model or the exclusive models will actually work better. Uh, the exclusive photographers, you know. Typically have their following clientele that they use. So I think your better model would be the Airbnb and allow whoever to join it, and then really vet them out with the, the reviews and the number of appointments that they get, and they will rise. To, the cream will rise to the top, rather than trying to get the cream of the crop to start out. I think you're going to have a hard time going that route. It, it, and I, yeah, I agree that's a, that's a good point, something we've struggled with. And so when I say exclusive, I guess right now we're not, we're still thinking large number of people, but we've found some people who want to join really aren't, they think they are. And so uh, trying to weed maybe some of those, those people out. I have a kind of a common question. Um, I think this is a great idea. I could definitely see how this is scalable. Um, I think as far as weeding people out, just to mention, now that you said that, I think that the photos themselves kind of weed people out. I don't, I don't think there has to be, because you can have a no-name person who has never been used, but who's exceptionally talented and kind of off the wall, 
but their photos and their reviews show that. So I think you can have an like automated vetting process. Um, the question I have is, a lot of these photographers are uh, self-promoters, and the successful ones are very good at promoting themselves. And you can have two photographers with the same capabilities. One's very successful, one's moderate. Um, how would you kind of control for the fact that, you know, if I if I uh, Google, you know, John Smith photography, ver uh, be routed to his website versus like let's say I find them on your website, what stops me from just going directly to them? Yeah, no, you, you hit on a good point because, uh, and that's our struggle with the transaction model because uh, you know what prevents them from circumventing our platform to complete the payment. Uh, and and I don't know if if we have a good answer for that. I mean, we 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 try to brainstorm ways that we could you know incentivize both the photographer and the customer to want to transact through our site and, and we're still struggling with that. So if anybody has suggestions. So one, one of the things I'm wondering about is the competition. You're not the first people to have this idea and you know the internet's been around for a long time. There's lists of all kinds of services out there. I'm sure there are other people that already tried to do this. How are you guys different? How have they succeeded? How have they failed? You know, what's the competitive landscape? Does somebody already have that moat? That you're wanting to build, that you're actually fighting against. Yeah, so so there are uh, listed directories out there um, for weddings. Wedding Wire is the big national one. Um, you've got other services like Thumbtack, um, even KSL here in Utah that that list photographers. Um, I think each one of those has has its problems. Um, I think Wedding Wire, they're they're a lot of them are paid monthly fees, and I think that to consumers it's not as genuine and authentic as you see all the first people that come up on the first 10 pages are people who pay to be there. And um, so we kind of really wanted to differentiate from that, number one, and, and not necessarily allow people to pay for you know featured placement that everybody kind of competes on this level playing field. Um, and number two, it's just, even like on KSL or whatever, um, you can find names of photographers, but you don't have pricing information. Um, you don't have a whole lot to go off, uh, an easy way to contact them directly. You know, um, Our site, you can bookmark, keep a list of your favorites, keep notes next to each of your favorites. So if you're shopping for a wedding photographer, you, know, you, can, you can heart 10 of them and they'll show up in your list and then you can narrow it down from there. So we have some features that I think aren't elsewhere. Um, so we are trying to differentiate ourselves, and that, that was one thought for, for doing the exclusive type route because every other platform lets anybody on, and so we thought, well, there's so much noise out there, maybe customers would appreciate us helping them whittle down the choices. Because uh, I think as human beings, we don't want to be confronted with the whole you know um, world that, uh, to choose from, but maybe we want to rely on somebody who's already kind of done the homework for us. I really like what Jonathan asked. That was what I was going to ask about competition because I looked up and you know you get thousands of hits. My question is, why are you doing this? It doesn't sound like there's any. I haven't heard any passion about you guys and photography. It seems like just a money play. And if it's, that's the case, how long are you going to stick with it until the next one comes up? Or what's your real passion behind this? Why would someone like what both investors were saying? Why would they pick you over? You know, why would they invest in you? What, why? Uh, for me, my, I mean, my story is uh, my wife loves getting, taking family pictures. And um, honestly, like I, I hate paying for family pictures and I hate going and figuring out who we're gonna get, where we're gonna do it. Um, and so I, I just thought there's gotta be an easier way. Um, and, and frankly, I mean, it is also a, a, a money play. I, I, Feel like there's an opportunity here so i'm not the i'm not the biggest i'm not a photographer myself i'm not the biggest fan of photography but i, I really um you know number one i think there is a need out there and i really am eager to help solve this problem once i see a problem i really want to try and, and figure this puzzle out um 
And secondly, I guess I kind of have a soft place in my heart for like a lot of these people who do this are stay at home moms, they've got families. This is kind of an additional source of income. Um, and looking at my own family with my wife, you know, like, I guess it's kind of a, a little mission for me to, to, to kind of help these people make more money and do things better. Um, so we have a third member of our team. Um, he's actually a photographer and he was the CEO of a, um, it's a, a television, a web television series called Framed. Um, so he's got experience in that. Um, me, I, um, you know, my jobs that I, that I do at school, um, I'm the VP of media production, and so it, it involves this daily. So that's, that's my interest in this. Yeah, so I would, uh, I, would, I would let that passion kind of come out a little bit more. Um, so my question kind of has to do with that user base. Are you looking for, are you going to focus, which I don't think there's a problem on wanting the elite photographers to be the ones that are there. Uh, but if you're focusing on that and you just people that you would like to help are those individuals that it's kind of a passion project. It's, you know, the stay at home moms. Um, if that's the case, I think there are going to be a lot more of those people that gravitate towards the platform. Uh, kind of talk about what John was saying. You've got almost a group on model coming down here. These people that You've, you've got the elite photographers that already have their, their customer base. They're not struggling for business. A lot of the people that are going to use this platform a lot heavily, in my opinion, are going to be the people there. They're not great at promoting themselves, so they want a way to promote themselves that they don't have to do quite as much work or they don't have to have quite as much skill to do. You're going to get those individuals on there, and you're going to be looking at you know whether it's transactional or whether it's a membership fee, that sort of thing. And then how are you going to get those people to, uh, the people that find you there to do what people do with Groupon, contact the, the vendor directly and say, hey, I found you on Groupon. We know they take a fee. How about we just go directly with you? Um, I think you're much more likely to find a, a larger group of people that are willing to be on the platform if they are those that are maybe struggling a little bit more rather than these elite, because the elite, they don't want to have to pay for the business that they can all already get otherwise. So it's just kind of my two cents. Yeah, and, and you bring up a really good point. And, and um, here's here's what we're thinking right now is um, when I say exclusive, I guess we don't just mean elite. Um, we're thinking like having three tiers. You kind of have your up and coming, your professional established folks, and your elite. And we do think that the numbers is kind of like a pyramid. You're going to have most on the bottom. Um, but but we still, uh, when we talk to photographers, especially the, the professional ones, they say, hey, you show me a portfolio of somebody new, I will tell you if they are going to be good and if they've got talent and potential. And um, so even we thought about having kind of an advisory board of these photographers that could help us, you know, mentor these up and coming uh, photographers and, and help us to know who's who's good, who's, who's not. Um, I'm going to put somebody here in the audience on the spot. Mark, I apologize if this is going to be uncomfortable. But you have a world-class photographer here in the audience right now. It's Mark Hedingren. He's got a BYU cap on. Um, he, I'm going to volunteer you, Mark. Sorry. He would be awesome to give you advice at a minimum, maybe serve on that board. Oh, yeah, that'd be great. We'd love to, love to have you. Um, but also, I wanted to touch on the uh, comment, too, about uh, people circumventing the platform. Uh, I love to read books, business books, and the interesting thing I, I heard about uh, Priceline um, is, uh, you know, they said this is just this phenomenon where in the hospitality industry, you can go directly and book with the hotel, right? But um, people just don't do that because Priceline is just so dang good at marketing. These hotel rooms, they're better than the Marriott or Hilton at marketing the same rooms. And um, sure, you could go to Marriott's website or Hilton's website and book directly, but people, uh, I mean, Priceline just got this immense poll and, and uh, network of users that uh, it, it just is not So I don't know, I don't know if that's possible to build in other areas, but, um, you know, I just found that fascinating. 
So question over here. Um, when you look at the photographers, and you kind of already touched on this already, looking at elite photographers or looking at different new and up-and-coming photographers, there's going to be a saturation point, right? There's only so much demand they can take before they say, whoa, like we can't handle anymore. And at what point, when you think about your bottoms-up bill for your market and looking at your TAM, at what point or what tools are you guys going to be able to provide to those photographers that's going to make you alleviate some of the pain of um, that demand pull on them so that they can do more business or they can add more value. Um, you know, you kind of touched on the board of advisors. What other tools are you guys thinking about to make their job easier? Um, <clears throat> so, so a couple things. Uh, some photographers I talked to said, you know, uh, if we did have a, a booking system, that would help. Not all photographers have said that. Some of them have. Uh, they can kind of be or better organized, um, know what bookings they have coming up, and if they can show, you know, the calendar of their uh, availability because they say, you know, I waste so much time text messaging, emailing back and forth, trying to figure out a day and time to, to do a photo shoot where I would just love to say, just check out my availability. It's up on the web. Um, so, I, so I think that's some, something that we could look into to find value. Another interesting angle is uh, I've heard is um, there are there are agreements and contracts that go on with especially with wedding photography and deposits and refundable non refundable stuff like that. Um, I think if we could somehow um, help in that area um, administratively, um, that would be a positive as well. But and lastly, though, I mean, what I I think. You know, if, if, if this is successful, if we can get people to kind of just, everybody kind of goes to shutter list to find a photographer, um, I think we can get a higher volume of uh, work for these photographers, and that will let them drop their price down and, and have cheaper prices, which will then in turn create more demand for their services. And so um, I know Uber's got that strategy where eventually they, they feel like they'll have so much demand um, for their drivers will constantly be working that, that the price per ride can go down. So I don't know if something like that's possible in the photography world, but it's an interesting thought. Um, I'm just going to throw in my two cents before I ask the last question. But uh, I, I think it's a really good idea. I think there's a lot of value for photographers and people looking to find photographers. Um, one, uh, one thing that it, it is a challenge to build kind of that double-sided marketplace, but there is a um, Dave Peterson works here in the startup building. He's kind of doing a similar thing with uh, people that make make music and then uh, people making YouTube videos. And he's been having some great success and in, in getting good signups for that. And so I think talking to him and seeing if he has any good tips on how to kind of hack these different markets, um, you could probably get a lot of good advice from him. Um, but anyways, let's go ahead and, and ask the final question. What can we as One Million Cups community do for you? Um, yeah, so uh, like you said, we, we kind of need connections, contacts, people who have been here before that may have some advice on building this two-sided network uh, platform. Um, that's a big thing. And then also another big thing is technology. So I have some web development experience and um, I don't know how far that can carry us, and and especially, I mean, I think eventually you'd want to have a mobile app in this world, um, in this day and age. So uh, that, that's something else that you know we're, we're kind of looking for help on. Awesome! Thanks so much. All right, thanks everybody for coming out. Um, thanks to our presenters, thanks to our panel, and thanks to everybody in the audience, and uh, we'll see you next week.